Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, so we have the first debate of this conference, and it's going to be no bad at this one, because yesterday I listed the questions I had in my head, and reading uh, some of the work done by my three colleagues, and I had over 30 questions. <laughs> narrow them down, and I have still more than 20, so we'll have to pick some of the questions depending on how you introduce your subject. And I would like mm -hmm. to start here on my left hand. I yeah. will start. Okay. You will start. Okay. <laughs> So thank you. please keep it short. Yes, that was agreement. Yes, uh, okay. the debate and other. Yes, yeah, so it was ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes, yeah. right? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yes. And please focus on on the major topics of your okay. research. Yes, yeah. of course. And yes. thank you, thank you very much for inviting me at the conference and for uh, the inspiration that I got from the previous speeches. And I am a, a, a local professor. Uh, currently, I am on leave because I am serving as a commissioner in council, which is the NCA in Italy. Of course, uh, I'm here on my personal capacity and uh, explaining my result of my research. But I have to say that uh, uh, also thanks to the position I am uh, in uh, to now, I am always very enriched by any discussion that uh, puts together and focus on the interaction between company law and financial markets regulation. Uh, uh, and loyalty share, they are a clear example to focus on this, uh, on this interaction, which is uh, very strong. Uh, I'm saying that because in Europe, uh, what we are experiencing is uh, uh, an attempt uh, to have uh, uh, a very high harmonization on financial markets regulation. We can think about the NIFI directive, we can think about uh, the uh, market abuse regulation. On the other hand, we do not, we do not have any harmonization at all on company uh, on company law and this put pressures on financial markets uh, regulation and how the, the market works and uh, to explain this uh, in three main points uh, uh, i will use the experience italian experience on loyalty shares which is quite young but not so young not to allow some conclusions and consideration the first one is why loyalty shares uh, in italy uh, uh, the first point is because of uh, uh, competition among jurisdictions, and the underlying question is, uh, isn't it because we want a more long-term shareholder? And then my second point is uh, uh, loyalty shares for market developments to increase the number of, uh, 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 of listed companies in Europe. And then uh, 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 it has been raised already, thank you so much, is the interaction between loyalty shares and mandatory offer, very intricate, but uh, not studied enough in Europe, I think. So from the first point of view, I have to tell you that in Italy, as you know, we have a very um, uh, uh, high concentrated ownership structure. I, do, I don't have time to, to give you uh, that, as but consider that uh, the overage now is 49% of the over, overage uh, uh, holding of the largest shareholder. For years, all the uh, literature was in favor of one share, one vote, because uh, this is an example of a corporate uh, democracy and uh, between cash flow rights and control rights, of course. But suddenly, in 2014, we had in Italy the introduction of loyalty shares in the form of tenure voting or time phase voting rights for listed corporations only meaning that loyal shareholder may be rewarded with double voting rights, no more than two voting rights, which is exactly the same that uh, was enforced in France from 1933. And this was uh, uh, why in 2014? Well, uh, of course, uh, uh, if you go through all the documents that uh, comes together to the, uh, come together to the uh, legislative degree, they say because we want to increase uh, uh, long-termism and to have more loyal shareholder, but as a matter of fact, in that year, one important uh, Italian corporation that was the Chrysler Fiat moved from the Italy to the Netherlands. And one of the reasons, I'm not saying that was the only one, was that uh, there was more flexible company law environment and was possible to have multiple, multiple voting. So this was not the only reason, of course, and other companies followed. So Basically, the reform in Italy was not, uh, didn't put an end of this uh, uh, migration to Italian population. So, basically, maybe the point was uh, we look where corporate law is more flexible and we try to change our own environment in Italy in the same way. This is my first point. Second, 
uh, development of the market. Uh, this is interesting because now in Europe, we have the listing act that is placing important, importance on multiple voting, not exactly, exactly on loyalty shares, of course, on multiple voting, but this is considered to be a device to increase the number of listed corporations in Italy. Why this? Because uh, we feel that uh, if you have a controlling shareholder and family founder in the corporation, they do not want to lose control uh, after the IPO, so they want to have uh, instruments to increase their voting power. So this is, has been discussed uh, uh, in the listing yet now, not for every corporation, but for those that want to be traded in the growth markets for, for uh, small, medium enterprises in this specific market. This is a proposal. This is a proposal with a quite high multiplier voting rights, which is another issue. We can have uh, multiple voting in Italy, in Belgium, in Spain, in France, but the number of voting rights that can have more than one is an issue, is a big issue. So if I look to the experience in Italy, I have to say that from uh, 2014, not a lot of corporations made use of loyalty shares or multiple voting uh, uh, to list. Of course, we have a few, we have six, uh, that uh, uh, they uh, uh, introduced uh, dual class shares in the form of multiple voting before the listing, since they are allowed to keep it after the listing, or other already listed corporations that uh, they modify their article of association to have loyalty shares. At the moment, I think we have 18% of the market value of corporation, listed corporation with uh, loyalty shares, uh, which is uh, um, the number is more than 60 up to more than two, uh, uh, 200 listed corporations. We, we do not have a lot of corporations. So uh, it's like a mixed feeling to see if this instrument really increase the number of listings in Italy. We know, we know that according to the OECD uh, empirical data, uh, uh, Europe uh, uh, is, uh, uh, has a decreasing number of listed corporations and Italy basically in, in, in the worst condition uh, in terms of number of the listing conversion to the listing. But overall, what I, I, I look at in my empirical analysis is that all these corporations that introduce loyalty shares in their article of association they are corporations in which a, a, a controlling shareholder was already there. So it was the controlling shareholder that at the very beginning uh, uh, was empowered to decide in the general meeting of shareholder to modify the article of association. So he had, he had enough voting rights to introduce the, these changes. And moreover, if you look to the report in the general meeting of shareholder, there are a lot of uh, reasons, but basically all the, reason, the reasons were we want to increase the loyalty of our shareholder, we want to increase long-term means, and we want to have more minority long-term shareholders, even if, if afterwards, we look at those that ask to be rewarded with double voting rights, because the mechanism is that you have to ask to be uh, listed in a register, and then after two years, you will receive the double voting. Always is the controlling shareholder that uh, has been rewarded with, with double voting. And I go to the conclusion and to my third point, which is uh, why only this shareholder? Because there is the mandatory offer obligation. And in Italy, not only you have to announce a mandatory offer and to pay a lot for it when you acquire corporate control. But even when you gain corporate control because of maturing double voting rights. So, and since the threshold, the presumption of uh, having control is in Italy, we have various thresholds, but ba basically for loyalty shares is 30%. No one is going to increase because of the loyalty shares at the stake, the holding in terms of voting rights, not in terms of capital, and then announce a mandatory offer. So, all the shareholders that uh, benefit from the loyalty shares are those shareholders that were already up to 50% or up to 45%, because if you have 45% that you can increase 5% without mandatory offer. It's a little bit technical. We do not have time, but this is the rule. So all the shareholders that were not calling in a mandatory offer in doubling their voting rights, they benefit from the mechanism. But Mainly, they were already long-term shareholders because they were the founders, the families, and the existing controlling shareholders. And the final result, my empirical analysis, 
uh, was a little bit old, but I'm trying to update my, my, my numbers, is that uh, after this, they gained the dominance, what I call the absolute dominance, over the extraordinary meeting of shareholder. Not only they were controlling shareholder, but because of the double voting right, they can change the article of association, the bylaw, because they have the number to do this, or because they have it, or because of the overage participation of the meeting, they have the two thirds of the capital represented, and so they can pass whatever they want and this meeting. So this is uh, basically, I think this is that means more. This is the result of my empirical analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Michael. <coughs> so let me reinforce uh, Chiara's argument slightly. So what's the pitch for uh, tenure voting or loyalty shares or whatever you want to call it? So we dislike dual class uh, because it's discriminatory. Not everybody can have it. So what's the advantage here? There's only one class of shares, and you can all have it. Because all you need to do is you need to hold two or four years and you get multiple voting rights. Two years, four years, you know, whatever it is, two times, four times, ten times the voting rights, comparable to dual class, except you can all have it. Um, now, then you bring in Mark's uh, narrative from the beginning. On top of that, you know, you're a long holder and long holders are good. And um, you know that solves also sustainability problems. So who could disagree with that? Now, um, if you then have a choice, uh, do you introduce dual class, which is politically not feasible, or tenure voting? Tenure voting becomes a compelling case for convincing policymakers to introduce it. And then in France, they uh, introduced the La Orange, uh, which is to reconquer the real economy. So that again goes in Marx's narrative you know, against these activist speculators and all the rest. Now, my argument is um, tenure voting is actually not better to dual class. It's worse than dual class because it is stealth dual class and it has a lot of undesirable properties. Uh, why do I say this? Uh, if you look at the reality, it is true that in legal terms there's only one class of shares, but in practice there are two classes of shares. Uh, bearer shares, and then in Belgium there are de sort of dematerialized shares in Belgium, uh, but then you have registered shares. And why do you need registered shares? Because you have to keep track of how long people actually hold the shares. Uh, how do you become a registered shareholder? You have to register. In Italy, for example, you have to register in a loyalty register. How do you do that? You send an email to the company. Can institutional shareholders send an email? No, they can't. Therefore, who can avail themselves of the multiple voting rights? Block holders, as we just heard, retail shareholders, okay, who cares about them? And of course, employees. And you know, employees are good uh, for the reason, obvious reasons. So the reality is, um, it's not different from um, dual class. Why is it worse than dual class? Because at least with dual class institutional shareholders, index funds that have held um, these shares for longer than the tenure period, so two years, at least they, if they buy B shares or A shares, whatever has the multiple voting rights, they get them. Here, they hold for two or four or whatever years, exceeding the tenure threshold, they don't get the voting rights. So they have one share, a fraction of the votes, because votes are being taken away from them. Um, now, could it be, would it be possible to fix the system and make it you know, do what it promises? Yeah, uh, it would require technology. You know, I'm sure that the exchanges could work out how to keep track of the, of the holding period uh, without taking out the fungibility of the bearer, you know, making basically registered shares bearer alike. Now, the question is, why have the countries in Europe not done this? I would argue it's quite deliberate um, because uh, they don't want the institutions to hold this. Um, so it is actually a bit of a scandal. Um, you know, if you then ask, um, is Germany right to not introduce tenure voting but to introduce dual class? Yes, actually, Germany is right. Now we can debate. You know, that's another debate. We can debate whether dual class is another is also a part of the yeah, well, yeah. But that's another debate. Uh, I think here I just wanted to make the comparison between dual class and tenure voting, and actually tenure voting is worse than dual class, not the better dual class. Yeah, 
first place in Europe. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm afraid some of the uh, challenge will have to come from the audience because it seems that uh, our panel uh, is pretty much aligned. My, my story will be more or less uh, in the same vein. I have an image that I often use when I talk about loyalty voting rights, and it's it's this one, the image of the Baptists and the bootleggers, uh, which is a concept, I guess, from regulatory economics, um, where you say that um, you can get very strong political coalitions when you have the same policy being pushed by, you know, idealists and vested interests. The idealists out of their personal conviction and the vested interest, of course, out of their personal interest. And there was certainly some, some vibes. Um, uh, I, I got some of these vibes when I first started working on, on loyalty shares about, about 10 years ago in Belgium, because on the one hand, you had this emerging academic, academic literature, you know, financial crisis, uh, Short term, short term is a is, is a problem. Um, 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 that that uh, proposed loyalty shares as a sort of one of the solutions. Uh, and on the other other hand, there was this immediate feeling of, of excitement, I guess, in some in some business circles, where they saw this as you know the the key that could maybe finally unlock the the one share one vote rule in some in some countries. Um, and so I I am persuaded that that you know. Um, all the talk about shortism and, and loyalty um, shouldn't blind us from the fact that when we talk about lo loyalty voting rights, especially in Europe, um, it is mainly about controlling shareholders. They are the silent partner in the loyalty voting rights um, enterprise. And I've done a recent paper with, with Tom and with two other co-authors, Theo uh, Momus, who is in the, in the room, uh, in which we evidence this link on three levels, the theoretical level, the legal level in Belgium, and then the empirical level. We also do some empirical uh, research. Uh, on the theoretical level, I will be very short about that, that. And you realize that if you look back at Tom's two models and the two transmission mechanisms, that the only way that loyalty void voting rights can, in theory, help to you know, uh, sever this transmission mechanism is through uh, a controlling shareholder. The thing just doesn't work without one, and then what do you get? We have to hope that the controlling shareholder improves the long-term view, which is possible, but uncertain, and there are costs, etc. Tom explained that. The second level is the legal level. You know, if you look at the black letter law in Belgium, and we have loyalty voting rights since 2019 in listed companies. Dual class has become possible in non-listed companies in 2019, but only loyalty voting rights in listed companies. Then you see that in key areas, you know, on, along key din dimensions. The regime that we have, the black letter law, favors controlling shareholders. We have kept an, an opt in regime. It's not like the Loi Florence, uh, an opt out regime. So you have to write it into your articles of association, but you can do so with a lower majority than you would normally have to do. So the normal majority in Belgium for article changes is uh, 75%. For loyalty votes, you get two thirds. It's the only article change where you have a lower majority. So that's clearly in favor of controlling shareholders. It means that given, you know, if you take a normal attendance rate in a general shareholders meeting, which is about 65% in listed companies, if you have 43% of the vote, you are full, it's foolproof. You, you can, uh, the, the insider can uh, approve the, uh, the proposal. Secondly, the registered shares. I will not delve into that. That's uh, Marco explained that you need to have your shares registered in order to qualify for loyalty board voting rights. And often controlling shareholders are the only ones or the only ones that matter who do so. Thirdly, also very importantly, the past holding period is grandfathered on the moment of adoption. That means you get immediate double voting rights for the two years that you already held your shares in registered form before the adoption. So you get <coughs> an immediate voting boost. And again, you've guessed it, the controlling shareholders are in practice the only ones who benefit. <coughs> And then there are certain exceptions. I will not go into detail that favor family ownership structures, etc. Because, for example, you don't lose the loyalty voting rights if you uh, acquire them through inheritance or divorce, where it's, it's a different person. So normally you lose them, but in that case you don't lose them. So there are a number of issues or, or a number of dimensions along which clearly the legal regime favors controlling shareholders. And then thirdly, the empirical level, we looked at. Um, evidence, um, and it really goes back to a, a, a master paper that Theo Mullis uh, wrote, so uh, 
I, I wish again to uh, <laughs> to congress for the it just won a prize on that. So congratulations for that. And and so we we, we worked with, with those data. We we updated it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we found is um, that okay, if you look at um, what has loyalty voting rights, uh, that what firms have adopted loyalty voting rights in Belgium, etc. The paper is now uh, going through peer review, uh, uh, by the way, and hopefully will be published uh, in a couple of months. Uh, and, and the cutoff is November 22, so you're really looking at, at quite recent uh, data. Uh, I would say five things. First, there is no gold rush on loyalty voting rights in Belgium. They are an important element of the corporate governance regime, but you cannot say that you know firms flocked to it. Um, we currently have 11 loyalty voting rights companies that are listed uh, in, in Belgium, um, which is about 10% of the total. So it's definitely lower than in France. It's also a bit lower than in Italy, obviously. Um, um, and, and I think after four years, if I read your paper correctly, you looked at the figures after four years. It was about 15%. Now it's up to 19 or 20% if I, or 18% if I'm correct. But in Belgium, of companies that have loyalty voting rights compared to the you know, entire group. Uh, and so in Belgium, we're still lower than that. We have about 10% uh, today. Um, and almost all of them did so in 2021. So we had a first batch, and then afterwards, it sort of uh, uh, petered out. Um, interestingly enough, in about 60% of the other companies that didn't adopt loyalty voting rights yet, it would be very easy to do so, right? Um, the vote of the insiders alone would be guaranteed to have the proposal approved given a normal turnout of 65%. So that means that you have, um, it's 56 of 98 companies currently on the stock exchange in Belgium, where on the votes of the insider alone, loyalty voting rights could be adopted and they don't do it. So that means something as well, probably. None of the IPOs, that's a very interesting result and uh, I find as well, because one of the reasons and was mentioned before is to, to, to encourage companies to go public. None of the IPOs in Belgium since 2019 has been uh, has taken place with loyalty uh, voting rights. Secondly, and I think it has been said as well, uh, typically <coughs> companies that adopt loyalty voting rights already have a very concentrated ownership structure. A little bit more concentrated even than your average uh, company. Um, the difference is not enormous, but, but it's there. Um, typically in Belgium, the insiders would own about 45% of the voting rights in companies that have adopted loyalty voting rights, it was about 52%. Um, and, and in most cases, 10 out of 13, this actually meant that the uh, adoption was guaranteed beforehand because the insiders had the votes to approve. Loyalty voting rights, given you know the sort of hypothetical standard 65% um, turnout. Thirdly, um, the non-insiders typically vote against loyalty voting rights. On average, 55% of the votes cast by the non-insiders were against loyalty voting rights. There's only one company in which actually the loyalty voting rights would have been adopted on the vote of the insiders uh, alone. There are two companies in which loyalty voting rights were rejected uh, because the insider that tried uh, to uh, uh, have the loyalty voting rights approved didn't have had a contestable control, uh, let's say, and didn't have the votes or didn't get the votes at the general meeting. Um, if you then look at what happens after adoption, how loyalty voting rights are used, you see that they accrue almost exclusively to insiders. 94% of all shares with loyalty voting rights in Belgium today, well, in November 22, were held by the insiders. Uh, and they create a, a, a voting bonus, a wedge between, you know, the economic ownership and the control of, on average, 11 percentage points. So percentage points, so in relative terms, that may be uh, higher. And it's always almost immediate. Immediately after adoption, the insiders get this wedge uh, because they already held the shares in registered form for three years or uh, more. So in your typical company that adopted loyalty voting rights in Belgium, the insiders had a bit more than 50% before the adoption and now have almost 65% of the vote uh, after the adoption. Uh, 
Um, that's, of course, relevant in our debate because clearly these controlling shareholders already control the company. They just enhance their control, right? But there's nothing in terms of long-term vision, long-term yeah. perspective that they couldn't do before, that they could do now that they have worked before. Worked. Now, what can they do or what did they do? There we see a tendency to reduce their equity percentage after the adoption. So there is, it's, it's not entirely, it's not 100%, but in 60% of the cases, actually the insiders reduced their relative equity participation after the adoption. So they use the loyalty voting rights as a means to keep control while selling down their stake. Now it's about split between actually selling down, selling shares and not you know, participating in capital increases. Um, and it's not, I think Tom pointed to that, it's not necessarily a bad thing because it might you know, give extra external financing means to a company where the insiders are constrained in terms of you know, their, their cash. Uh, but, but still what you see here is that loyalty voting rights in, in practice, if you look at all these elements, function very much like multiple, like, like dual class shares. Um, and, and, and that you see also in Belgium in the numbers, and that leads to a number of questions, but I think I'm sort of um, almost, almost over time, ago. not yet, okay. Mm -hmm. So to conclude, three points. Um, loyalty voting rights in Belgium are designed to favor controlling shareholders and have thus far operated mainly as a control and enhancing um, uh, mechanism. Secondly, also interesting, I think, is that not all the controlling shareholders have picked the low hanging fruit. So there is some apprehension somewhere there uh, within a lot of companies um, um, about adopting these uh, mechanisms. And you see that in practice also, um, you know, there is some apprehension about, you know, the reaction of financial markets of institutional shareholders, uh, etc. Uh, and you may speculate that the insiders will mainly uh, resort to this mechanism when, you know, they are, um, um, they have concrete plans for certain operations or for selling down their shares or, you know, something like that. Um, and third uh, element of conclusion, so as has been said before, in practice, they function much like dual class shares, but that leads obviously and the loyalty part is sort of the, the smoke screen, uh, uh, a political sweetener, if you want. Um, but that leads to, to two questions, obviously. First, why not allow dual shares directly? And that's, that's the evident one. Uh, loyalty shares are a quite burdensome uh, administrative and, 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 and transparent way of creating dual class. But secondly, and I will conclude with that, it is very odd that, uh, in, in our view, that they come um, with so much uh, lower uh, minority protection. Because dual class shares are typically very difficult or almost impossible to adopt or to modify midstream, right? You can maybe do it upon IPO, but afterwards it becomes very difficult. And loyalty voting rights are a single class, which is technically entirely correct, right? But functionally a little bit artificial. Uh, and so there are spirits of, you know, most, if not all of these protections that you normally have around dual class. Even more so, the law actively facilitates, that's my last point, facilitates their uh, adoption against, you know, the opposition of the, of the minority shareholder, the 66%. In Italy, I think there was a temporary uh, regime. Uh, in France, we have the opt-out regime, etc. And that is, uh, in, that is, I think, very difficult to, um, to defend from, uh, from a more policy-oriented perspective. So I think it's fair to say that the uh, overall sentiment is negative, mm -hmm. um, which makes it a, bit, a bit of a challenge to start this debate, but I'm going to try to do it anyhow. And my first question to all of you, uh, and I'll start with Marco, um, if all this um, loyalty shares story and, and, and even multiple or dual class structures are so negative, uh, why has Europe, for example, or national legislator not tried to uh, preserve the one share, one vote principle better than we did. Okay, I didn't say that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, uh, my pronouncement was on dual class versus loyalty shares. So let yeah. me. Okay. That's the second question. Let me, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But let me let me maybe because um, I didn't use all my time elaborate. elaborate <laughs> uh, you know, two points on you know why I think loyalty shares 
And you kind of said they're more complicated to run. Mm -hmm. Let me just make two points on that, and then I'll come back to your question, which is the broader question. Why do institutional shareholders oppose dual class? And you know, I'll now make clear I count loyalty shares as dual class. So why is this, why is loyalty shares less transparent? So you mentioned it already. It's legally speaking one share class, functionally it's dual class. Uh, so the normal protections that apply uh, in the law that return that pertain to capital, changing capital structures, don't apply because this is a purely statutory thing. And that then, as you know, Chiara said, if you have the supermajority, which you get, you can do all sorts of things. And I invite you to read uh, Campari's uh, arrangement in the Netherlands. It's really quite extraordinary what they, you know, what the controlling shareholder can now do with 68% of the voting rights. Uh, you, you couldn't do that with dual class, basically. The other feature is that you're never quite know, you're never quite sure how many votes there are at any one point in time. Because it doesn't just depend on how many shares you hold, but you know how, how many shares everybody else holds. So every month uh, they have to publish the number of votes that are out there. You know, and the story continues. And then there's takeover rules, you know, and then this is a legal ordinance. So, you know, I mean the, the, the law, the legal text that will be written about this once you start having problems are going to be endless. So you know, there are very good reasons why dual class is just much more transparent, uh, easier to handle, more established in law more comparable in the US. Now, last footnote on this, in the US, um, Smoker, which was my favorite tenure voting example, they've ju just done away with it. So in the US, uh, people now are much more honest. They say, we want dual class, we like it, we take dual class, forget about that time based voting, which is, you know, I mean, doesn't really work anyway. So in Europe, we should just be more honest, okay? So that's, that's you yeah. know, my first point. Yeah. Okay. Now, so let's talk about dual class. So uh, I think you can make very good reasons for dual class shares. Uh, so for example, um, we haven't talked about heat pumps, you know, like one of the German traumas is that carrier just took over uh, our, you know, one of our favorite uh, German heat pump companies, Bismarck. Uh, carrier has a market cap of 34 billion. The sales price was 12 billion. The Wismann family is going to be a bit in the board of carrier. They, you can ask yourself what you know what would have been like if this one had gone to market with dual class 10 to 10 to 1 uh, they could have taken on some leverage could this one have, as a family controlled company have taken done the takeover of carrier quite possible uh, with one share one vote not possible okay? so I do have sympathy for people who call for dual class for whatever reason it is, but then we are moving to a different conference. We're moving to the mm -hmm. Tel Aviv conference, <laughs> you know, with Lucian Bepchuk appearing in the room, <laughs> plus causes, you know, and we are on to different turf. But that's sort of like, you know, the, a long answer to your question. Okay. You, we moved from mandatory one share, one vote to vote to dual classes with all the limits in non listed companies and loyalty shares in listed companies. Did we make a mistake? Well, uh, I think we did, um, uh, unless if you look at it from a sort of long-term perspective, that the loyalty voting rights are just, you know, the step that we needed to take in order to arrive at uh, uh, dual class. And to be clear, um, I'm not against loyalty voting rights as such. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm in favor. I have defended, uh, I, I have criticized the fact that they were prohibited by law. I don't know if they are good or bad in a certain given company. I am skeptical, um, but okay, you never know. The American example is a counter example, obviously. Um, I would be much more happy if they could sort of pass the market test in a true challenge with dual class shares. In that case, you know, if you see loyalty voting rights, you might, you might expect that, you know, for that company, because, you know, one size doesn't fit all, it's a, it might be uh, interesting. One example, one advantage of loyalty voting rights that wasn't mentioned is that, you know, also with dual class, there is a lot of talk about, you know, should we have sunset clauses and mandatory sunset clauses because, you know, what's good for the control, the controlling shareholders that's good today is not necessarily good in 10 years, etc. And loyalty voting rights, in a sense, come with a built-in sunset clause, right? Um, 
So maybe that's an advantage. What hasn't been mentioned on the other side of the ledger is that the uh, administrative burden for the company is quite harsh in comparison to the dual class shares, which is very simple. Um, you know, keep track of all the exceptions in your, you know, in your share book, you know, when parents die and pass on to children or when change of control of the company mm -hmm. uh, is affected, etc. cetera. Uh, but so um, I don't think it's a mistake because it's, a better, it's, it's better than what we have, I think, on that. But I would favor uh, at the same time to take the next step but um, if we don't do so, and that's what my point, I, I find it difficult to understand, and that is a mistake, I think, why we should push them through, you know, push them down the throat of minority shareholders. I did it in France even more, mm -hmm. but in Belgium, I mean, that's, that's, some, yeah, that's so an element that I think is a mistake. A strange coalition between government and uh, these companies in Belgium. Yeah. Here, I turn to you uh, with a double question. One, what as I think in your country both dual classes and um, loyalty shares are more. So maybe we can have your view on that. And the second question, maybe can you also touch upon the need to harmonize more at European level in this field and not to let the regulatory competition play, because then you get what you get now. Belgium, France and, and Italy are not necessarily the best example of regulatory competition, if I can hear the panel. Um, is that feasible? And if you look at the proposal indeed made for small and medium-sized enterprises, it's just multiple voting rights with only one prescription, if I'm not mistaken, or one rule, separate vote for class, and that's it. There's no limit on uh, the multiple or the multiplicator. There's no limit on protection of minorities. There's no limit or there's no rules on other uh, um, minority protection in this view. Is this a mistake by you? Okay. Okay, thank you. This is the core of the discussion, of course, and I have the opportunity to come back uh, on a few issue that I was too fast and I also apologize with the, with the audience. So first, uh, on the situation in Italy, yes, uh, we have both, we have uh, multiple voting as a dual class uh, for non-listed companies and then tenure voting, time-phased voting, right, or loyalty shares. So I, I look at the numbers, the number are the following, 2 February 2033, we have six listed company with uh, the dual structure, multiple voting. How is this possible? Because of course, this is for non-listed corporation, but if they have before the listing, they can keep the, the multiple voting after the listing. And the multiple voting is three, three votes for each share. Yeah. So there is a limit. Exactly, so there is a limit in the number of multiple voting. And so we have six listed company with dual class, which is a different class of share for the ordinary one. And then um, we have uh, um, uh, in the date, this date is 2021, 69 listed company up to 215 with uh, tenure voting. So a quite successful instrument is more or less one third of the number of listed companies, which is 18% of the market capitalization. Okay. So they are small, medium enterprise, more or less. Among these 15, when they did the IPO, uh, they uh, used the opportunity uh, to use the holding period before the IPO. So there is a single that uh, there is in Belgium that when you go to an IPO, we can put in the article of association the tenure voting, and you can benefit from the pre-holding period before the IPO. And uh, this was about 15 listed company now that. Uh, uh, they went to the IPO with double voting, not as a dual class, but tenure voting. So I was not negative, I would like to say, uh, 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 or, or at least uh, my message was not to be negative overall uh, uh, on tenure voting, was to, be, uh, to discuss a little bit on the premises of tenure voting that was uh, long term mm -hmm. because my point was, uh, okay, in Italy, where we have tenure voting, maybe the controlling shareholders were long term already, even without uh, uh, this tenure voting, because they were family, they were the founders, uh, and we can discuss more on this, we do not have time, but maybe this was not the instrument to increase the long term mechanism. Despite, despite the fact that um, I, 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 I read um, a paper uh, uh, that was produced by a Sony in Italy, which is the association of the list company, and they said that uh, um, uh, they built uh, an ESG ratio 
And uh, the finding was that uh, this ratio was higher in companies with control enhancing mechanisms. So they found that uh, where there is a control enhancing mechanism like any voting, the ESG rating was higher. The rating was uh, with regard to corporate governance, which is uh, how ESG is uh, incorporated in the strategy if there is uh, a sustainability committee. So basically, they found is a preliminary analysis the first year, of course. They found a positive correlation between ESG in terms of the sustainability on long term and control and analysis mechanism in some, in some corporations. To say that uh, I'm not negative overall, I was just trying to challenge long termism and mm -hmm. uh, uh, tenure voting. And two other important things to, to mention uh, uh, um, again. Uh, one is uh, that uh, the problem of transparency. Maybe tenure voting are more transparent than other control enhancing mechanisms, for example, group uh, pyramidal structure, cross shareholding, shareholder uh, uh, agreements that were really widespread in Italy. So maybe tenure voting is more transparent in this respect. Of course, there is the problem of the register because uh, in a corporation, if we are all the shareholder and we are all registered, it's not public unless uh, we are over a certain specific threshold. So uh, the possibility for the market to know the number of shareholders that will be rewarded with annual voting is only when uh, the first, the fifth of every month, the public, the company have to public the number of voting rights. So we have a fluctuation month by month, as a in theory, on the voting rights of our corporation. So this is quite complex, of course. but. We have to remember one last thing that tenure voting, they have no value for the controlling, for the announced controlling power because if I wanted to transfer my share to Mark, they will lose the double voting right. So, Except if we get married. <laughs> But this is correct and a very, let's say, uh, clear way to, to, to push forward the, the problem. So, no transfer of control, we cannot transfer, and it is relevant in the of regulation still because there is no value for this change of, of control because there is no change of control, basically. Of course, a lot of being said in Italy, you can introduce the sunset clauses like the one you said, uh, due to. Uh, uh, so to lose a double voting in case of heredity, for example, but no, no one, of course, has introduced this sunset clause. Uh, so in case of our marriage, uh, we will keep the, the double voting as a source. And so this is really complex, and this is an interaction you can see between the financial market and corporate flow. So my point is that uh, it's quite difficult to have uh, a full, a strong harmonization in financial markets without having uh, harmonization at the level of company law. And the listing up is the example, looking at France, Belgium, Spain, where tenure voting and double voting exist, mixing this and uses this as an incentive to have more companies to go public in, in Europe. So using an instrument that is already existing, already exists in some member states and doesn't exist in other, and to change the multiplier of voting rights, but to use this instrument, uh, and again, to try a sort of harmonization at the level of financial market, where the level of company law is not harmonized at mm -hmm. all in Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah, but nevertheless, the, the, the <clears throat> member states who have introduced uh, royalty shares are <clears throat> carefully copied to a very large extent in short example. Exactly, <laughs> this was my first point, thank you so much, because in Nepal, we had loyalty share because of company moving abroad, because of looking at France that was turning, of course, in the default rule, the tenure voting, while in Italy is an opt-in solution, looking one to the other, absent a, a, a normalized framework, they look one to the other. Mm -hmm. They don't ask themselves, uh, is this good or bad? But if this exists uh, in the other member states, uh, this is something that uh, I can assess and evaluate if I want to be a flexible model of copy governance for my companies. The race to the bottom. Maybe. Right. I don't know, but I mean, no, the lack of harmonization, I would put it yeah. this way. Marco, Maybe, the, I mean, just yeah. on the harmonization yeah. point, because I know you care very much about it, there is this recent uh, proposed directive um, from yeah. the Commission. Uh, which, that was my next question. Yeah, which would actually impose 
you know, member states who have multiple voting rights. So and that's class. it, that's not voting rights and suffrage vote for class, and that's it, huh? Yeah, but on the level of growth, you know, companies yeah. visiting growth, uh, on growth markets or whatever, but, but we've gone from very far from, you know, almost in the 90s, mandating one share, one vote as a harmonized harmonizing measure to now mandating multiple class uh, shares uh, in the, in, under, under the label of harmonization. Yeah, yeah but again, the harmonization that's being proposed is very, is, is very far reaching in the, to the extent that uh, mandate, uh, multiple voting should be obliged uh, or should be obligatory for small and medium sized enterprises. It should markets. be permitted. No? Well, permitted, yeah, permitted. permitted with the only uh, correcting rule that a separate vote per class uh, has to be allowed in that case. That's it. Europe doesn't propose more harmonization than that, which is limited. Yeah. Would, would, would that pass your test, Marco, or do you think European legislation should go further in protecting minorities, for example? Um, well, the, we haven't talked about the Dutch, um, and the remarkable thing... But they is, get away with everything. Oh. <laughs> So the remarkable thing, because that's another legal topic, is the uh, corporate mobility charter competition, uh, which we haven't discussed. So the one of the other fascinating things about this topic is the move of the Italian companies to the Netherlands. Because when we had our first uh, roundtable in Brussels, uh, Luca Garavoglio, the chairman from Campari, came and he said, based on our experience at uh, Fiat, it's not possible for a profitable company because of tax reasons to move a uh, corporate seat of incorporation in Europe. And then he moved Campari very successfully, <laughs> and, you know, not when they made a loss. So it is possible to move to the Netherlands. And then to your point, the Netherlands offers you everything, dual class and um, tenure voting, still dual class, let me call it this way to be clear, still dual class of any type you like. Okay, so it is the mecca for control enhancing mechanisms. I'm not going to give you the name of the law firm that may brings this to you. Uh, they are very creative, just you know, not far from here, just a few kilometers. <laughs> so the question is, um, do you want to shut down the market for you know, charters in Europe, uh, for establishments? Yeah. Uh, and you know, uh, are you going to impose limits on the Dutch? That's the real question. So this other thing, enabling other people to introduce the dual class statute, you know, either voluntarily by law, is really a sideshow. The question is, what do we do with the Dutch? Uh, <laughs> it's been a question in European company law since the 1960s, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Dutch copied the English, so it's getting very complicated. Um, what about dual class, uh, loaded, loaded vote shares and mandatory bits? We heard that both in France and Italy, uh, the votes are counted for mandatory good purposes with some corrections. And in Belgium, yeah. that was not the case. And it was, amongst others, widely criticized by you. But of course, if you give additional votes to um, uh, controlling shareholders and then you force them to do mandatory bid, comes a very costly affair. So what do you think about that? Can I start with you? Yes, thank you. Well, uh, this is exactly uh, what I saw in Italian companies. Only when when they were free from mandatory offer, they benefit from the tenure voting because they were already more than 45%. So no worry about uh, a the mandatory, the mandatory bid. And uh, there are some waivers, of course, uh, just in case it happened to overpass the relevant threshold because of maturing the uh, double voting, which is uh, the temporary holding uh, that if you do not vote, uh, you have time uh, to, to reduce, let's say, the number of voting rights or, or rather like the involuntary overpassing the threshold because in theory it's only theoretical maybe, but in theory <coughs> you can overpass the mandatory threshold involuntarily because it depends on someone else uh, selling the shares uh, Reward, rewarded by double voting, so decreasing the total number of voting in a certain corporation and so you up you are holding in terms of voting rights that was decreasing the total number of so as I mean it seems like like, like a joke but this is a reality. So in Italy there is a rule saying okay we look if, it, if this is an involuntary overpassing the threshold you are not incurring on a bid if you do not have the same threshold in terms of uh, uh, capital uh, mm -hmm. so very complicated but I mean this is uh, the uh, the um it comes directly from the mandatory offer obligation to be consistent in terms of 
of the discipline. Of course, one can say, well, but if I'm mature working rights because I am loyal, I'm not acquiring control. So this is, I mean, uh, left to member states still because the uh, 2004 takeover like, directive uh, is an old one, not considering tenure voting, at least for one, one, one element. And uh, uh, this directive leaves a lot of room for interpretation to member states. Mm -hmm. So in Italy and in France, uh, if you overpass the threshold because of maturing double voting rights, because you are royal, this is a matter of uh, mandatory offer. If you all remember 2004, I am quite old that when uh, I, I was studying company law and financial market, it was this, the takeover bid directive, and they consider multiple voting on, in one respect, uh, because the directive says on the break rule, uh, this is up to the optional arrangements, of course, uh, multiple, uh, uh, multiple voting rights, they are basically uh, neutralized in the meeting after the acquisition of control. Since they are considered poison pill, uh, basically, they, they do not count if someone acquired control in the first meeting to change the board, for example. So the takeover directive uh, uh, consider multiple voting as a quite strong poison pill, uh, an anti-takeover measure, and include the fake uh, in the breakthrough rule. Of course, no one wanted this rule, so they were uh, uh, subject to an optional arrangement. So if a member state wanted to place it in the law, otherwise... Uh, uh, don't uh, as doesn't so still very complicated but uh, the original idea in europe was multiple voting they are against the market for corporate control mm -hmm. this was the starting point of the discussion you in belgium i don't think you pronounced yourself and that in your last paper that i saw but uh, the, the fact that the belgian legislature deliberately excluded mm -hmm. the um the loyalty voting rights from from achieving the threshold for management they thought it was good or bad well, <laughs> good or bad, I'm not sure. But I know that at least um, what, what I wanted to say is that um, that will explain that two companies in our sample uh, actually adopted loyalty voting rights in Belgium, where probably in Italy or in France they wouldn't, because there were about 20-25% insider control and they went over the 30% thanks to the loyalty voting rights. So we would have the success would have been even, even lower, uh, I guess. Um, and and in terms of yeah, is is uh, I, I I tend to side with with Tom uh, on on that, uh, thinking that there is an issue there with you know legally with the directive, but I'm also critical of the mandatory voting, uh, the mandatory bid rule uh, more generally. So <laughs> I guess not too bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing after all. But that, that's I mean it's very complicated uh, uh, to to weigh these factors. Uh, Marco, we want to react as well. Yeah, so I'm just reinforcing my point. So the only reason why this doesn't pose practical difficulties is because index funds are deprived of the multiple voting rights. If index funds got this, you know, you would have a wildly fluctuating number of votes. And then the block holder could never be sure whether they hit the mandatory bit threshold or not. In fact, you know, you could never be sure. You'd have to every day look on your phone and see, you know, it's also true with significant holding disclosures. So it would be a complete mess. Uh, and the only reason why this works because you know, the shareholding institutions don't get the votes. So, mm -hmm. you know. yeah. And maybe on that point, there was a proposal in Belgium to actually broaden uh, the loyalty voting rights to dematerialized shares. Um, and, and then technically, I don't know how it would work exactly, but there was. I understand they that it's doable. They didn't have a technical solution yet. Sorry? They didn't have a technical solution Well, I understand solution. it's doable, yeah. but okay, you have to work on that. But that, that one was one of the of the counter arguments to, to kill the proposal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe I should let you talk two minutes about your point of view of mandatory takeover bit and uh, loyalty shares. Yeah, I was also a bit conflicted about writing this paper because I was, I'm also not the biggest supporter of, of mandatory bit rule, but I think if you have one, to not count loyalty voting rights seems absurd to me. Um, and I do think it also may actually be a violation of, of the directive, um, but I haven't seen any people trying to do that, um, uh, try to do something about it. I think it's also an excellent example, again, of, of what you would mention, that the legal regime is clearly designed to benefit controlling shareholders. Um, and this was uh, not a clear example of that. And, and I think because I'm not a big fan of, of introducing loyalty voting rights in the midstream, 
I was, yeah, I disagree with uh, with the exemption from the mandatory visual because that could have protected minority shows, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mandatory bit rule is, is mostly there to be avoided in Europe. That is a very clear package. Mark. Uh, so uh, on the index fund, I'm wondering if there's another element that we could add to this political economy uh, analysis. I like the bootleggers and uh, and Baptist, so um, one of my favorite papers. So we got the bootleggers and Baptists in this situation. And then who are they expropriating? So if it's disproportionately loyalty share index funds that can't register or other institutions that, that can't register. And this is partly a question, partly um, uh, partly a nasty statement. Is that is this France and others using loyalty shares um, effectively expropriating foreigners' investment in the capital of their country? So even more so to the benefit of the state, maybe to the French state was the main beneficiary of the world. Yeah, and I think in the beginning in France, loyalty shares were even excluded for non-French shareholders. Did they change that? No, they changed that. It's nationality neutral. You can be a Mundi or you know, whoever you are, you don't get it. It's nationality neutral in that the original exclusion of foreign shareholders is eliminated. But if the institutions who disproportionately are investing are foreign institutions, then this is a nice stealth, um, mild expropriation, which I mean, I don't for a lot of with, countries that would be. to do with savings, but it doesn't matter. You know, this has to do with the way people with retirement savings around the world, mm -hmm. which most of them happen to come from the US. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't discriminate. Uh, GPI, oh. and not, and, you know, Norges, uh, you know, it doesn't discriminate. They don't get it. No, but in terms of the form, we got. No, okay. I think there is a point there. Sorry. Go ahead. You have more information about the structure <laughs> of ownership than I think I probably have. No, but I think in, in, in terms of political economy, like who pushed for the Loire Fleur d'Ange and why was it introduced? And uh, I think there is really a point there that clearly the, the people who are not going to benefit from the double voting rights were the uh, institutional investors. Well, they were French or neutrality or neutral, uh, nationality neutral, but in practice, whereas who was going to really benefit was the French state. Um, in ex yeah, I mean, okay, but that's, you know, but let me give you a counter example to your, I, you, there's even a counterpoint to your thing now. Um, if the Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund invests, they can probably register in the loyalty register because they don't, they're, they're like a block holder. Mm -hmm. So if it's a foreign sovereign wealth fund and they don't need fungibility of the shares, they can register. So, and there, there's no discrimination. So if you're a foreign block holder, and you could be you know, from even a controversial country, and I'm not counting Qatar as a controversial country, <laughs> um, you, know, you can register and you get a lot of money. We have an idea of the number of the institutions who couldn't register and that run. Well, the only thing you see is you see who's held for more than two years, mm -hmm. for example, such the structure. And you know that I've held a block consistently for four years of four percent, and you see that their voting right is less than four percent in countries where that's disclosed much far. And it's all of that. Norges, Blackrock, State Street, you know, all the ones over the disclosure flesh. I have two questions or three questions from the room, and I can take two. So I start with more, more, more like a comment. I think there's at least to me there's one elephant in the room that is missing in the discussion, which is the price. Um, and we know for, for for France, there's a study by my cohort in management science that those firms that were opting um, the, the, the act or not opting out, they underperform relative to the others. <clears throat> we uh, have been talking about the Dutch discount. I remember from my times in the Netherlands for a long time. Uh, because of all of these mechanisms, I guess if a company goes public with these mechanisms, they can realize a lower price per share than if they wouldn't have these uh, mechanisms. So, so therefore, I think the, the, the element that needs to, to, to be discussed also is to what extent uh, the shareholders that are enhancing control are suffering from that by either realizing on the IPO a lower price or uh, in the future when exiting or reducing some of the stakes. 
So in the Florence study that I did with Annette, we didn't find that. So you know, no IPO discount difference, and we also found no Q difference. So, but you know, I think that's an empirical, it's an interesting question, and especially an IPO. There was a comment on the question, so I have two questions left. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I didn't have a, I don't have a question, but simply on the Mark Rose point about uh, disenfranchising uh, foreign investors. Uh, I don't think uh, that's true, but what is true, as far as I know, is that both in Italy and in uh, Belgium, when this legislation was introduced, certainly for Belgium, I'm, I'm pretty sure the only protest that was registered came from US-based uh, investment clubs. So they wrote a letter to the government, and as, as far as I remember, uh, yeah, also the, in, in Italy, uh, you also had protests mainly coming from the UK and the US. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, just one last question, then I get back to you, if I am allowed. And then we. Yeah. So, when you see a control company adopting loyalty shares, usually one of the arguments that they make is we need to have loyalty shares now because maybe in two years we will be making an investment in your position. So from this point of view, the provision that we have in Belgian law, which allows to adopt loyalty shares and considering also the time before the adoption, would be uh, a good policy to make possible target contracting. So you can have a, a controlling shareholder pay into the market, have a sort of acquisition that we'd like to make, and it raise more capital. But uh, if there is more capitalist control, so give me loyalty shares. So in this case, you can link loyalty shares to actually a good investment. Otherwise, if you adopt the policy that we have in Italy and France, you need to trust before the control shareholders will use loyalty shares to make a new investment and not just to sell shares. So I think that this feature that obviously the favor of control shareholders also one benefit because it makes possible private contraction and maybe can be also be a step to go. We can further the private contract and can have even uh, the approval subject to minority, uh, the majority of minority uh, investors. So, in this case, you can say we approve a lot of shares, but we need to have the majority of minority to approve them, and you can convince them because you already have uh, an investment to make. And I don't think mm -hmm. someone uh, made uh, this argument because, it, as they are a structure, usually potential order introduce them because they need to have them before the time when they might have the need to make an investment. So they solve the problem of uh, horizon. I think we have to keep it here. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, it was an interesting debate that wants a lot of things, but still needs a lot of questions also. So it's good to stop until the end of the afternoon. Yeah. Mm -hmm.